appellants of the deceased's murder. A fifth defendant was unanimously acquitted. Juror X was immediately arrested and was later convicted of attempting to pervert the course of justice. There was no evidence to connect his activities with the appellants. The appellants appealed against their conviction to the Court of Appeal of Jamaica, which dismissed their appeals. The Court of Appeal granted permission to appeal to the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council on three grounds, which were, first, that the trial judge failed properly to inquire into allegations of juror misconduct, secondly, that the trial judge departed from standard practice in inviting the jury to retire to consider their verdict so late in the day, putting undue pressure on them to reach a verdict, and thirdly, that the trial judge erred in admitting the telecommunications data because it had been obtained in breach of the Interception of Communications Act and the Charter. The Judicial Committee of the Privy Council has unanimously concluded that the appeals should be allowed and the appellant's convictions should be quashed on the ground of juror misconduct and that the case should be remitted to the Court of Appeal of Jamaica to decide whether to order a retrial of the appellants for the murder of Clive Williams. The board has considerable sympathy with the dilemma faced by the trial judge on the final day of a long and complex trial. Following the allegations of bribery, he had either to continue with the 11 remaining jurors or to discharge the jury. Despite this, the board considers that the approach taken by the judge was a material irregularity in the course of the trial, which makes it necessary to quash the convictions. This is for three reasons. First, the direction to the jury on the final day was inadequate to save the situation. The judge simply reminded the jury that they had sworn or affirmed that they would return verdicts in accordance with the evidence they had heard in court. The judge did not refer to the alleged bribery of which, if the allegations were true, the jurors were already aware. Secondly, the trial continued with the allegedly corrupt juror serving as one of its 11 members. In the board's view, there should have been no question of allowing juror X to continue to serve on the jury. Allowing juror X to remain on the jury is fatal to the safety of the convictions which followed. It was an infringement of the appellant's fundamental right to a fair hearing under the Jamaican Constitution. Thirdly, the judge should have considered whether the remaining jurors might have become, consciously or unconsciously, prejudiced for or against one or more of the appellants as a result of juror X's behaviour. For example, there was a danger that the attempted bribe could have made the other jurors overcompensate, consciously or unconsciously, if they assumed that the offer must have come from one of the appellants and that therefore they must be guilty. The judge took no account of this risk. The board is very mindful of the serious consequences which may flow from having to discharge a jury shortly before the end of a long and complex criminal trial. It is also very conscious of the danger of deliberate attempts to derail criminal trials by engineering situations in which it is necessary to discharge the jury. In England and Wales, there is legislation which allows a judge in certain situations to discharge a jury because of jury tampering and to continue the trial by judge alone. There is no such legislation in Jamaica. It follows that there will be occasions where, as in this case, a court will have no alternative but to discharge a jury and end the trial in order to protect the integrity of the system of trial by jury. In view of its conclusion on the issue of juror misconduct, the board holds that it is not necessary to express a concluded view on the other two grounds of appeal. For these reasons, the appellant's appeals should be allowed. The court is now adjourned.